Hello all. Um, that's me, my big brown <laughs> mouth. I wanted to cover a couple of things in this talk. One is prevention, which I was asked to do, and the other is access to treatment. Um, at the moment we've got a fair idea that only about 50% of people with HIV are accessing treatment at the moment, and um, NAPRA is unashamedly pro-treatment. We think it's good for people. We, we see a lot more positive outcomes than negative. Um, that said, we think it's important that it's the decision of the person with HIV whether they treat. Um, and in doing so, they need to be provided with as much information and supported through their decision-making process. Um, so the first bit on prevention, which is at the added bonus to treatment, um, I suppose the big, um, the big moment was in 2008 when some Swiss doctors put out the Swiss statement, which is in essence said that in the following circumstances, people with HIV are not in sexually infectious, and it's when their therapy was taken consistently, so they were adherent, when their viral load had been undetectable for at least six months, and when there were no STIs present. Um, that was intended to be something that was only going to be used amongst physicians in Switzerland um, in, in discussing with couples. It went global. Um, the thing that was not picked up and it went global was the certain situations, which was essentially stable relationships. Um, so there was a lot of hoo-ha about it. I, I, I'm sure a lot of you remember when it came out, and it was sort of used as an excuse by people to undiscriminately have sex, or seem to be seen as an excuse to do that. Um, I thought I'd give that as a bit of history. Virginia mentioned it in her talk, it's quite an important one. Then a couple of years later, or three years later, um, it seemed to be sort of backed up by the HIV Prevention Trials Network 052, and I just thought I'd cover that a little bit because we've all heard about it. It essentially um, looked at near 1,800 serodiscordant heterosexual couples, and I say heterosexual couples, but there were about 50 gay couples involved in um, Africa, Asia, and South and North America. The positive partners were randomised to either start treatment immediately, so they were all um, either between 350 and 550 CD4, delayed until their CD4s dropped to 250. So based on pill count, they were highly adherent. What happened? There were 28 transmissions. There were actually 39 in all, but only 28 were linked, and so it's kind of interesting. Linked to the partner they were with. Um, one in the early arm, so one in the treatment in the group that were treating, and 27 in the delayed arm. That's where we get the the um, figure of 96%. Interestingly, the one seroconversion in the early arm was linked to a, um, a couple where the positive um, client had only been on treatment for a, I think a month to six weeks. So there's, there's room to push the 96% up a bit. Anyway, that's basically where we get that figure from. The other um, important studies that came out last year are a couple of PrEP studies in heterosexuals, the TDF, among sexually active heterosexuals and the partners PrEP among heterosexual couples both in Africa. Um, the difference being um, the, the, um, whether they were in couples or they were sexually active singles. Um, the first one, TDF, um, was just testing um, Tenof, um, Trivada, so the com combination. The second one was trying Trivada and Tenofovir on its own. So we get a difference of between 63% and 73%. But the important thing about PrEP is that um, the higher adherence, the higher the adherence, the better it works. So people who, had a, um, who adhered much closely had roughly 90% protection. Um, and I think that's important because we're talking about PrEP now. Um, in certain situations, not in all situations, it may be useful particularly for people who are sexually promiscuous, um, for those who are in, for whatever reasons, in a serodiscordant relationship and the partner's not on, on treatment. Um, these are the PrEP guidelines that have just been released in the US where PrEP's been approved, that it's recommended only for those at high risk, 
that it must be taken on a daily basis. And this is something that we, we you know, if it's taken periodically or um, disco dosing, as was once called, it just doesn't work. Um, it's important to ensure that the person is not already seroconverted when they, they go on PrEP because it's only a, a two pill combo, so it's actually the possibility of developing resistance is there. And obviously follow up is important. I mean we know there are people taking PrEP at the moment in Australia who've, who've got access to, to um, Travada and are u using it as a prevention strategy. Um, so if anything else the importance is taking it on a daily basis. I want to I look at the, um, these two things, PrEP and um, treatment as prevention, treatment and prevention, treatment as prevention, whatever we call it, within the concept of combination prevention, which is where we're at now. Um, essentially at the very beginning we had behavioural intervention, we didn't have much else, so it was either don't do it at all or stick with your partner. It worked, you know, um, I won't say much more about that. Um, we know that HIV counselling and testing, particularly testing works, if people know they're positive they're going to adjust what they do. We definitely know male condoms work at least a 95% you know, success rate. We know that female condoms work, although they're not that um, readily available, which is an issue. Um, we know treatment, treating STIs works as a prevention strategy, as, do, as does male circumcision, I think about 50, 50 plus percent protection. Microbicides for women, Jeannie mentioned that in her talk. Topical um, Truvada based um, applied, um, an incredible um, move forward particularly to protect younger women um, at risk of HIV transmission who are unable to negotiate condom use by their partners. It's a fantastic, fantastic um, advance. Um, hopefully it'll get to the point where we, now, where we have an anal um, microbicide or a multi-purpose microbicide that'll protect both partners and also be a um, um, protect you against other STIs and be a um, protect you against pregnancy as well. This is sort of long term forecast. Treatment for prevention, which we just covered. Positive prevention behavioural. So, this is stuff around um, zero sorting, only having sex with partners of the same zero status, um, pos um, strategic positioning. So, the positive partner being the um, um, I was going to say submissive, can you say submissive? Receptive partner. These, they work at, at certain levels. Um, oral prep, we know that works for both MECM and for heterosexuals. Post exposure, exposure prophylaxis definitely works. And vaccines up to a point, we've had, um, I think the Thai study was something around 30% had success, which is still moving on. So at the moment we've got a smorgasbord of, of prevention techniques, not all of which suit everybody, which is fine. I mean, some of them are much better than others. So it's, I suppose it's, it's something to think about when you think, well, we've got condoms, why, why are we looking at any, anything else? We've, yeah, we've got condoms, but we've got a number of other things that have proved their, their worth, if you like. So I think that's a, um, an inspiring um, slide, if you like. I pinched it from someone whose name's dropped off the bottom, I'm sorry. <laughs> what I do want to talk about is access issues. Um, we know that not everybody who, um, for their own benefit, is on treatment at the moment. And um, my colleague, Lemon, is, is currently running a, a trial to understand the issues that um, cause them to decide not to treat or what might encourage them to treat or you know to understand this issue more. Um, these are three of them, psychological barriers, cost restraints and prescribing restrictions. So I'll just cover them briefly. Um, the psychological barriers are probably best explained with a couple of quotes. Um, Commencing was terrifying. I was scared and the night before I started I was a mess. Initial physical reaction was minimal, so that was a relief. <coughs> Changing meds is also a scary thought, which I'm trying to avoid. This is a, a, a really common um, 
experience for people going on treatment or preparing to go on treatment. It can take up to four years longer for people to actually get to the point of going on to treatment. It's a, it's a, it's a major um, life-changing sort of period in their life, probably the equivalent to finding out they're positive is to actually going on to treatment. Why? Possibly um, we get a hint of it in this next quote from another person. I thought it would be difficult for me to commence med since this would be an acknowledgement of the progression of my, of my HIV and I think this is significant. I mean, um, we, we have the sense that our bodies should be able to cope with HIV, that um, if they're not, then somehow we're failing, that accepting treatment is an, exception, is an acceptance of failure and this is something we need to, to address and, and um, counteract. That, that it's not an acceptance of failure, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to a means, you know, it's support, you know. Um, however, since starting my meds, I've found that a lot of small irritating conditions have cleared up and my overall health has significantly improved, which is another experience. People have this huge fear about going on treatments. They go on them, it's actually not as bad as they thought. They suddenly feel better, and that's something that's often not... Um, talked about when, when we talk about going on treatment is you actually might feel better on it, you know. You might not think you don't feel particularly good now, but you're actually, you know, your body's constantly dealing with a, a replicating virus, you know, and to go on something that combats that is going to make you feel better, you know. Skin, skin irritations particularly tend to clear up. I'm just grateful every day that the meds exist. These are a couple of quotes from um, an Ar the Archer's Tracking Changes study put out last year, which is well worth the read. Doctor-patient relationships. This is from um, um, the Atlas study, which is a, a, a global survey done by um, HIV practitioners. Um, there are some Australian participants. Um, this was just some of their um, 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 some of their thoughts on, co on communication. 38% wanted more specific involvement in treatment decisions. 28% didn't believe that side effects were adequately brought up. But sadly, 20% didn't actually understand what the doctor was telling them. So I think this just feeds into the fact that this whole um, doctor-patient relationship on both sides needs to be um, improved. You know, patients need to be a lot more expressive about what they want, what's going on for them. Doctors need to be able to interpret that. Um, it's a difficult scenario. I feel for our um, friends, the GPs, who have to sort of deal often with, you know, um, a patient who reveals very little and try and make decisions for them when they don't want to make them for themselves. Um, we'll move on. This is a, pop, a more positive slide, it's from Futures. The next one's out shortly. But it's, it sort of shows the change in, um, in um, difficulty, I, I suppose, around taking drugs since 1999. So we're looking at some sort of, you know, significant um, issues, remembering to take them, the side effects of taking them, organising them around meals, taking large numbers, taking them in public, carrying them. We've got quite high um, quite high numbers, particularly in the first two, but look, over the years, how much it's dropped, I mean, between, you know, less than 10 years, we're down to quite low, low numbers. So the actual issues around treatments has improved considerably. Um, and I think this is worth expressing to our clients. The next issue is cost restraints. I mean, we might think that the, um, the um, prescription cost isn't, isn't huge, but we know from Futures and from BGF that a large number of people with HIV um, are on government support. 31%, so a third, report that they live below the poverty line. Um, most of B well, BGF clients survey nearly half require assistance with HIV medications and, and over half with other prescriptions. Um, everybody with a chronic illness spends up to 30% of their income on, I think as well as medication, their treatment care, things associated with their illness. 
And the important thing to remember is that nearly 10% of them delay or reject filling a script. So this idea that treatment for themselves is not as important as a number of other things in their life. Um, and for every increase in cost, there's a decrease <coughs> in the number of, of prescriptions filled. I mean, this was brought to home when I was on a, um, did a road show with Positive Life and we're in Tamworth and I was talking to a woman afterwards who confessed to me that she'd been skipping days with her two pills, she was taking two pills, and she was skipping days and taking them alternative days and had been doing this for years, it was on her third combination because the others had failed. And it was, and her, her only reason for doing this was to save money, you know, the significance. And I, and I think, I mean, you've all, possibly a lot of you have been in a situation where you're coming to the end of a script and you think, oh, I'll miss this day. It means, if, even if it's not a money thing, it's about not having to go to the chemist to fill it. You know, it's, it's, it's significant and we need to address it. These are the, um, the issues that come up from costs. So the bottom line is we actually want free treatment for everyone with HIV. It's, it works in other countries, you know, it will work here. Or at least one dispensing fee, regardless of how many drugs you have, and that's really important. At the moment we've got these multi-drug combinations which pose, um, you know, a, a positive basically, because it's one pill once a day, you're paying one dispensing fee. But we've got, a, again, a smorgasbord of, of drugs available. Um, we shouldn't have to be paying, you know, if you're getting three drugs versus one, um, plus, and this is equally, if not more important, access to subsidised antiretrovirals for all people with HIV in Australia. Medicare and eligibles is a, um, well, it's a sad indictment on what's going on in this country. Um, we're back to a position now after filling a, um, a study called the Temporary Access called Temporary Residence Access Study, of finding treatments for people who don't have Medicare, can't afford to buy treatments. We're down to trying to find, get them into studies, get them to import drugs from overseas. It's, um, you know, it's ludicrous. So this is, these are the bottom lines, if you like. Prescribing restrictions. We're in this sort of weird grey area at the moment where there's not, there's not, um, there's not good clinical trial evidence that treating above 500 is, um, is any better than treating just under 500. So our guidelines at the moment only support treating people between or below 500. And this is both our guidelines and the highly specialised drug programme which, um, which funds them. However, many clinicians will support someone's choice to treat at high counts. So I suppose um, what they're doing is interpreting the, the symptoms, um, clause if you like, um, and I think the other thing is particularly if their partner is HIV negative. My, my concern with this is if we've got two individuals, both above 500, both who for whatever, you know, for their own personal reasons want to go on treatment, yet one has got a, a negative partner, so they're supported to go on treatment whereas the other one isn't. I don't think that, that's fair. I think everybody with HIV who wants antiretroviral treatment should be given it or should be allowed access to it. This is um, just a little bit about when people start treatment. So currently, and this just came out at, at ASHAM, um, the average CD4 count at diagnosis is 430 CD4s. So it's not particularly high. About a third start treatment within a year to two years, so between 30 and 50 per cent. But the majority wait for much longer, and nearly 50 per cent it's the doctor's decision. Um, about a third it's the patient not being prepared. This is the last slide I want to finish on, and, and it's a bit, bit cluttered, but the circle.